Now tonight I want to speak on a principle that runs all through the Bible, a companion message to the little message we brought last evening. Last evening we talked about the fact that no one, whether he be saved or unsaved, can receive God's truth unless your heart has been prepared, so to do. You can't, you can't sow seed on stones and make a crop. And since we are begotten of the will of God by the word of truth, and since we are not born from above apart from the reception of God's truth, and since the truth must find lodging and it must take root before the new birth happens, every sinner is enjoined to prepare his own heart for the reception of truth. I call your attention afresh that even if you're a child of God, you can't rush into the presence of God. I know this easy familiarity we have today, everybody's awful buddy-buddy with the Lord. Your grandpa, when he was called on the lead in prayer, it him about 30 minutes to address the deity properly. You know, you know some of you folks, you're all so young, I can't talk to you, but way back then, I remember those old gray beard Baptists, you call on to pray, it take them 15, 20 minutes to to address God properly. They thought he was a high and lifted up one. They weren't as buddy buddy as we are now. But uh, you can't receive any spiritual truth apart from heart preparation. Now, every truth in the Bible is non-receivable except is this principle. There isn't a truth in the Bible that isn't against what we were born in, what our nature is, and every demand of God and every demand of His Son, the Lord Jesus, will kill you in the flesh. And if a man wishes to receive anything from God, he just better take seriously what James says, be swift to hear and not so swift to book, and prepare your heart so that you may receive the rooted, the engrafted word, which that word, if it takes root, is able to save the soul. Now tonight, let us follow up the thinking by stating the fact that God Almighty reserves his best only for people who want his best. Of course, he makes them want it, but they have to want it. It's the principle of the Word of God, of the dealings of God in the Old Testament and in the New, for it's the same God and they're the same dealings that God Almighty will say, for instance, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, break up your fallow ground. Break up. I'm fixed to do something now, so get your plow out and break up your own heart. Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. And then they enjoin to circumcise yourself to the Lord in their hearts, in the foreskins of their hearts. Now, are you prepared to accept the truth? I know you are, trust you are, and yet I'd love to dwell on it a little while tonight, and that we are forbidden in, in the book of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount in New Testament language, he'll say in different words what the prophet is used of God to say for God in Jeremiah. So not among thorns, break up your fallow ground. In the New Testament, my Lord will say in Matthew 7 and 6, <clears throat> Matthew 7 and 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. If you don't pay attention to what I'm saying here, a principle the Lord says, 
you go ahead and offer holy things unto dogs and just indiscriminately cast out the pearls before a bunch of hogs. And you'll wind up by being trampled under them. Lest they trample them under their feet, they'll just turn aside from the holy things. Don't want that. They'll just trample those precious pearls under their feet. And that ain't all they'll do. They'll turn again and rend you. They'll tear you apart. Holy things, precious things, Pearls of great price are reserved only for prepared hearts. If salvation were an offer, it'd be different. But salvation is a gift. It is true that Christ, in the language of some of the confessions, is freely offered to all men. But in the language of the Bible, Salvation is the gift of God, and Christ is that gift. And it is a principle of the Word of God. God never varies from it that he does not offer a gift to somebody who isn't prepared to accept it. You don't turn down a gift. You can turn down an offer, but you can't turn down a gift. A gift you can receive it, but you can't, you can't reject the gift. Now, it's true that men reject everything they know about Christ and despise it and all that, but salvation in John chapter 4, as the Lord plainly told the woman at the well, salvation is a gift of God. My Lord bought the right to give eternal life to as many as the Father hath given him. Isn't that what it says? And he has a right to deal with all men, because in that sense he has bought all men, and he owns all men because of creation and purchase price. He bought the right to deal with all mankind. And the gospel is a covenant arranged in the Godhead whereby the Lord would give eternal life, not offer, but give eternal life to some people, and dispose of the rest as seemeth good in his sight. God doesn't give his gift to people who will despise. He doesn't, he doesn't say, now here's a beautiful thing, and I want you to make up your mind whether you'll take it are, are rejected. No, salvation is Christ's precious gift. And he has the right and he exercises the right to give his gift to people who would not trample it. They'd be glad to receive it. This is a principle upon which God works. Now, whether we can swallow it or not, we are butchers of souls if we ignore the plain teaching of the Old Testament that hearts must be plowed, that the ground must be fallowed, that it is downright disobedience to the principle on which God works to attempt to sow amongst thorns and expect to hurt. It is true in the New Testament and in the Old that the spiritual laws of harvest are exactly like a farmer in the state of Pennsylvania. The farmer goes out and plows deeply. Isn't that right first? And then he cultivates, and then after, at a certain time he, he sows the seed. And then the rains and the sun come, and after a while he goes and looks for a harvest but he doesn't look for a harvest before the plowing has been done. And he doesn't sow the seed before the plowing has been done. And neither does God. This is a law that cannot be ignored unless you wish to become a butcher of your own soul and a butcher of every soul you touch. For it is eternally true that they only get God's best 
who sincerely want it and long for it and who are capable of appreciating it. Now let me repeat my premise. If God were going around offering, leaving it up to man as to whether he'd accept it or reject it, salvation, that'd be one thing, but that isn't what God does. Salvation is a gift of God. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh, my Lord said, given me authority that I should do what? That I should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given me. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and his Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation is the blessed boon from heaven, and it comes as a gift, the gift of God, the gift of God. Now, God doesn't simply give his blessings out indiscriminately. He gives them out only to those who are prepared to receive them. Now, if you want to get in theology, if you want to, I don't get to it, of course. If you ever receive this precious gift from God and you start tracing back how it happened, you'll be like the sainted Spurgeon. Everything will go right back to God. And you, uh, you won't know it beforehand, but afterward you'll find out that the reason you sought the Lord is because he first sought you. But you won't know that beforehand, will you? And you'll find out that the reason you love the Lord is because he first loved you. But you may not know that beforehand. Don't try to be a theologian. Just try to get to Christ. And then after you get to Christ, you can trace it back, and you'll find that every blessing flows from God. Is that all right? But it is true that holy things are for the holy. The deep things of spiritual experience are not for all men. Follow me now. The mysteries of the soul's converse with God are not to be lightly divulged in common talk. I want to repeat that statement. I've written it down. The mysteries of the soul's converse with God are not to be lightly divulged in common talk. Such language as the maiden in the Song of Solomon lying on her bed are not for public conversation. Beloved, my beloved is mine, and I am his. The Apostle Paul had an experience uh, where he was caught up in the third heavens, whatever that means, and he saw things and heard things that he said he couldn't talk about. And he didn't even mention the fact that he'd had that experience, and he never has until this good day tell, told us what it was. But he wouldn't even tell us that he'd had such an experience for 14 long years. You see, the deep things that go on between a child and his parents, or the husband and the wife, are not for the marketplace. They're for the inner circle of the home. And so be it for the deep things that go on between a person and and Almighty God. Oh, the easy familiarity. It well nigh assumes the proportion of blasphemy of us today. Now, buddy, buddy stuff we call salvation. We're on such good terms with the King of glory until we've lost all sense of the wonder of being invited to come into his courts and to sit at his feet and to bask in his presence. In the Old Testament, the last book, it said of some people, they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, but they didn't get out on the street corner and broadcast it. They that feared the Lord spoke often one to another in the book of remembrance you remember was written now here's what I'm getting at when we try to stuff precious jewels down the throats 
of the unprepared. All that they'll do is angrily turn against you and rend you. Let me illustrate. You get a hold of a precious truth in the Bible. You'd read the Bible for 20 years, and you'd never seen it. And then like a flash, for all truth is learned like that. It's a revelation. It's an illumination, you see. See what I mean? It comes like that. You read a text a thousand times, never meant a single word. And then you read it. And there it was. And you wondered, it's been there all the time. Why hadn't you been able to enter into it? You hadn't been prepared for it. Your heart wasn't prepared for it, just bounced off. Just went in one ear and out the other. I've had that experience, and I know you have, you're a child of God. Just bounced off. But when God's providence hemmed you in from a thousand different directions, you weren't aware of them, and hemmed you up to where that word was God's word for you at that time. And it's just like a flash. You say, oh my, isn't that wonderful? I never saw that before. And you tell the truth. You never had seen it before. Why well, wasn't Because you're dumb? No, you weren't prepared. You weren't prepared. You hadn't been hemmed up into that place where that scripture could be made flesh to you. Just in the same proportion as the Son of God was made flesh in the Incarnation. And if you try to stuff spiritual truths down the throats of unprepared people, you're doing them harm, beloved. If you're not willing to be as patient as the farmer is in trying to raise crop, see what I mean? Even in talking to a brother Christian about truth and revealed truth has to be revealed. You believe that? You don't learn revealed truth. You experience revealed truth. All spiritual truth is spiritually discerned. And it comes by what? It comes by revelation, a flash, and an illumination. That's the way it comes. Now, this is a good place for people who at least in their heads, would like to be true, as I hope you do and I think you do, to those great doctrines of the Word of God that have fallen into such ill repute in these last years. Beloved, one of our greatest, greatest obstacles is that that which we receive by revelation, we get mad at somebody else that they won't receive it because we told them. And we do them harm, and we shut the door, and we ignore a precious truth that blessed things from God are, able, are received only by people who prepare. Let me illustrate, if I can, what I'm talking about. Then my privilege through the years to be with many, many different pastors. And as I've grown a little older, I've got, I hope, a little smarter. There are many truths that I'd like to talk over with the preacher, but I dare not open my mouth until I've been around him a while and see that he has an open heart. And I usually do not bring up in it the deep things of the work of the Spirit and things like that that I dearly love to talk about with a brother until I see that he's opened the door and I have enough discernment to find out that his heart's ready. He could receive some truth that he doesn't know a thing on God's earth about. But if you jump in and try to cram that truth down when he's not prepared for it, You'll make a lifelong enemy, and you'll almost close the door. Not all the time, but lots of time. You'll close it so tight, it'll never be opened again. Now, that same principle is true in trying to witness to a blind, blinded, devil-blinded, 
Well, that's what's the matter with men and women. It's not that they in a worse than we are. It's just they're still blind. We used to be blind, and they're terribly blind because they were blinded by the God of this age. And they're just blind in one respect. They're smart as whips in lots of respects. And they're just blind in one thing. They agree with us on all the truths in the Word of God. The average lost person in this town will agree with you on every truth of the Bible. Most of them will. But the difference is they see no beauty in Christ. They believe in Jesus. It'd be hard to find anybody in Carlisle, stop me if I'm wrong, that would tell you he don't believe a thing about that fellow Jesus. Not many here, are they? I don't think so. Uh, but they don't see any glory in him. They don't see any beauty in him. There's nothing about him that attracts them. Why? The sun's shining, but they got no eyes to see. People are in a terrible shape. They're blind. They're blind on one thing. They don't see the glory of God in the glorious gospel of God. They don't see any glory in it. And that's how Satan has fixed people. He doesn't lead people into immorality. That's the work of the flesh. Satan has nothing to do with leading men into what we call immorality. That's that's just the product of the flesh, the old sinful nature. Satan uh, puts all his eggs in one basket, and he just concentrates on keeping men blind to one thing. So blind they can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ in the Word of God. He can just keep them that blind, no matter about the other. You see what I mean? And here we are. Christ, if we've come to know him, is glorious to us. And if you had similar experience to me in this respect, and I expect you did, when you came to see him for the first time and taste of him, you couldn't understand how all those years you spent as if there weren't any Christ. Now, with some impatience, you think that in a sin you can cram the glory of Christ into an unprepared heart, but you can't. Are you willing to be as patient as God is have that heart plowed, have it prepared. Only prepared hearts can work through the veil of mystery and come to saving faith. Let me illustrate one more way. Everybody I ever deal with has faith in Christ. I, I doubt if you could find a person in Carlisle, Pennsylvania that hadn't got faith in Christ. The Mohammedan believes in Christ. He does. He'll tell you he's as good as a great prophet almost as Muhammad. The Orthodox Jew, I don't know or can't speak about the modernist Jew, but the Orthodox Jew will tell you he believes in Christ. I've had him tell me that numbers of times. He does. I've had them tell me that they believe he's as great a prophet as Moses. The modernist, it's a little hard to corner one of those fellows, but we hear a lot about them. They believe very deeply. They have great faith in Christ. But there's a difference in that and saving faith. We ought not to be blinded here and misled that we're living in a heathen land. No, sir. Well, everybody's got a Bible and swears on a stack of Bible to believe every word and they never read it, but they believe it. And yet everybody in America believes in Christ. That's right. Now that's so. But only the prepared heart can receive Christ. And Christ is never offered to any except those who are prepared to receive him. We can't wish Christ off 
telephone people, as hard as we like to do. Now, if you rob him of his glory and rob him of the awful scandal of his cross, you have no difficulty getting people to accept that kind of a Jesus. But if you refuse to strip him of his absolute glory and sovereignty, sitting on the throne with the reins of every human being in his hand, controlling the destiny of everything that rise and wriggles, and if you will not present the cross as a nice little Sunday afternoon picnic sentimental thing, but as the awful scandalous, agony, agonizing, bloody, butcherous, terrible thing that it really was, of course that's offensive. If you rob Christ of his absoluteness in his work on the cross and his ministry on the throne, people will receive it. Because an unprepared heart doesn't want to go to hell, if there is one. But only a prepared heart wants King Jesus to be the absolute ruler of his life. Hearts must be prepared. Give not holy things unto dogs. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. If you do, they'll just trample them under the feet, and then they'll turn and rend. That's about the best picture in the New Testament, as far as this old preacher is able to see, of the average church now, present company, I hope, except it. Boy, it's a pretty bad place. It's sort of dangerous to be a church member now in a lot of circles I run in. Especially if you have a business meeting. I'm telling you, you've got to have a sheriff and two deputies to keep order and keep folk from getting shot. All oh, the remedy. What is it? People who've had Jesus wished off on them. People who've had holy things given them, they never did receive them. They're just going through the motions. And it doesn't take much of a firecracker to start a pretty big explosion <clears throat> in a situation like that. Well, sir, they'll rend you. I don't know many pastors, and I know quite a few, that aren't looking for a place to move. Surely it won't be as much hell in that church just over the hill <clears throat> as there is in that one. You see what we did some six forty years ago we, we thought we were smarter than the Lord. We'd ignore the laws of a spiritual heart. we get people who didn't give a hoop about the glory of God. Looking out for number one, and we vitiated and perverted the gospel and fixed it so God was of no use except somebody to turn the ice cream freezer for us and got people in our churches and they've been trampling holy things under their feet ever since and rending everybody that got in the way until now the greatest task facing the churches of America is that they need to be evangelized themselves and I know a few churches today that have got anything to say to an outside world. They are such a hotbed of rebellion against the holy claims of Christ inside. They can't press those holy claims on anybody outside. Our hearts have to be prepared. John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way to make a what? A people ready. Isn't that right? That is his job. The Lord sent, organized his disciples two by two and sent them ahead. In every village where Christ was to come, he sent the two disciples to prepare the way. And they were given instructions that if they were not received, shake the dust of the cities off of their feet. Jesus withdrew himself in such circumstances that records in the Bible says he did no mighty works there because of their unbelief. 
We need to remember afresh that there's no gospel, there's no good news for the impenitent sinner or the uninterested, the take it or leave it, or the happy-go-lucky. The gospel is not for secure people, the old Lutheran theologians used to say. The gospel is for people that are uneasy, lost their moorings, or weary, or hungry, or thirsty, and so forth. The law is to be preached to secure people and the gospel to people who've lost their way. Now this principle, let me make three applications of it before I quit. God deals with the church after this principle. I would not wound anybody for I'm in the same shape, but a church that's willing to settle for less than the best will get less than the best. Is there any hope in our day for a congregation of people that will not be satisfied with things as they are? Mr. Spurgeon said, Give me hungry people. Give me broken people who will not rest as long as the crown rights of King Jesus are ignored by the multitude? Have we come to the day when the only thing we as church people gather together in a local assembly, the only thing for us is to say we can't have anything better? God deals with churches after this principle. We do not have the best because our hearts will accept less. And he doesn't give his best to churches unless those churches are prepared to appreciate it and cherish it. I believe that with all my heart. It's still true that God gives bread to the hungry and he exalts the lowly and bring humbles the high and mighty. It's still true. Let me, let me just read one verse of Scripture. This, this, this would fit a church, wouldn't it? Or it wouldn't be the real interpretation. In Isaiah <coughs> chapter 66, Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord, uh, who, verse 8 Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? And then this, and I, I've never been able to handle this next phrase. I just read it to you. For as soon, as soon as I travail, as soon as she travail, she brought forth children. As soon as she prevailed, she brought forth children. What do we want as brothers and sisters in a local congregation? <coughs> do we want a deep moving of the Holy Spirit? One of the things that's been a cross that's weighed awful heavy on this poor preacher it's for nearly 38 years. This September will be 38 years I've been preaching. Most of those years trying to be preaching a gospel that can be believed but not understood. Shutting men up to abandonment of all hope in themselves and casting themselves utterly on God. The thing that hurts me so, I can shut my eyes and think all over the country, the thing that hurts me so is the prayerlessness of our congregations. I do not know of a church, I hope this is the exception, that's a praying church. Do you? I mean a congregation people. Oh, that Brother Jones, Sister Smith, and 
Deacon Tutwiler, three, four members, have some devotion, some agony in their home life. We call a prayer meeting and hope our folks will show up. Oh, is it hopeless to hope? The spirit of grace and supplication would come on a local congregation and you'd have a church at prayer. Praying for what we, uh, what do you call yourselves around here? I don't like any of the terms men use of us, but praying for people who dare to believe that only the Holy Spirit can open a man's blind eye. He uses means, but he's the only one who can do it. I can't. Trying to preach a gospel that won't get, you, you won't see a, 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 a flea at his eyes unless the Holy Spirit takes charge. Well, that's what we're trying to preach. It cannot be understood by anybody. Salvation by grace is too deep for the wisest man that ever lived. To understand it. No wonder the unsaved man said, wonder what on God bless those people are talking about. He cannot receive the things of God. The natural mind cannot receive. And that's what the scripture says. Do we believe it? He cannot. I don't care how hard he tries. He cannot receive the things. They are spiritually desired. And the cross that breaks my heart even tonight. These young preachers and whole churches and Sunday school teachers coming together all over this country now, and their numbers are getting to be legion now. And they think we can preach this message without being baptized in the tears of real intercessory prayer and see results. You can't preach what you call the Calvinistic approach to the gospel of Christ and get results unless it's bathed in prayer. That's the God's truth. How much longer are we going to think that truth in itself will get the job done? It will not. It will not. Mr. Spurgeon was putting as good a preacher as I am. <laughs> that poor little fellow was so weak that 300 of his choicest men never did get here and preach. They were underneath the pulpit, the podium, down in the basement of the tabernacle in London, on their knees, praying together every time he preached. And we talk about, oh, just look at the souls ushered into the kingdom of Mr. Spurgeon. Now you listen to me. He couldn't beat me preaching much. There's not that much difference in me. There isn't. There's not that much difference in me. He had 300 men on their faces praying that the gospel would run well. They used terms like that. Praying for the progress of the gospel as it was being preached upstairs. I wish we could quote and see uh, his theology so much and face the fact that Mr. Spurgeon didn't believe that what he preached would get the job done unless the Holy Spirit took charge. And although he couldn't explain it, and neither can I, and neither can you, prayer has something to do with the outpouring of the Spirit of God. I know it does. If we wanted the best, I believe we'd get it, beloved, even as a congregation. I kind of believe we would. I don't know, because I've never had any experience, but I'd sure love to be around where it's tried, Brother Pastor. Some people that at least spend as much time as a congregation meeting together, to pray together as you meet, to hear you expound the Word to a bunch of people that have no hearts to receive it. See what I mean? Hearts must be prepared. Do we want the glory of God in our midst? Going over to Lancaster Wednesday night, 
We listened to a tape by the Englishman, Brother Packer, delivered over, I think, at Westminster Theological Seminary. And he called attention to the 14th chapter, 1 Corinthians, where the pattern is set that of an unbeliever and an unlearned one come into your midst if the circumstances are right. He'll fall down on his feet. He'll be, he'll be stabbed in here. He'll be convinced of all in the very secrets of his heart. Things that he himself, not even conscious of, will come out in the open. They'll be manifest, and he'll fall down and worship God, and he'll go away. And the first fellow he meets on the street, he say, "You know something? God's up there." It made my heart hungry again as I thought of that chapter and of our services today. I've been in so many of them. I was there. Some people were there. I don't know whether God's there or not. He didn't make himself manifest if he was. Nobody had the secrets of his heart pulled out, made so he couldn't ignore them any longer. He was convinced this is the work of the Holy Spirit. As long as we're content to have nice services, I expect we're going to have them. I can't speak with authority now because I don't know by experience much about what I'm talking about. But I do believe in my heart that a church must be prepared. And it must prepare its own heart. Break up its own fallow ground. Don't! So among thorns. Don't expect a crop if the seed falls on stony ground. Only ground prepared can receive the gospel. The evidence of the reception being bringing fruit under perfection. I think God deals with an individual child of his on this same principle. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Read much of the Psalms where the highest peak of Old Testament sainthood is vouchsafed to manifest. Early will I seek thee. My soul asketh for thee, for thee the living God. The longer I live, the more I know. By experience, I think a little bit that the seeking that started when God first arrested you way back yonder is to continue and it must get hotter and hotter all the while until you see the Lord. A Christian is a seeker. He's not somebody that's satisfied and settled down on his leaves. He's a seeker. He's a comer. The book of Hebrews calls the child of God somebody's always coming to the Lord. He's just forever and eternally coming to the Lord. Like the Lord would get weary, but like the little child stumps it toe. Mama! Or when they get a present. Mama! Or when they're hurt. Mama! When they're happy. Mama! When they're hungry. Mama! When they're thirsty. Mama! They're always coming. That's the child of God. What do we want as God's people, as individuals? fullness of the Spirit and insight into the Word of God, power and prayer to be used as a witness. I think God deals with lost people this way. All the invitations of the Bible are limited to folks who are hungry, thirsty, or weary. Not a one of them addressed to anybody who wouldn't be glad to hear it. Oh, everyone that thirsteth. Well, somebody says, I'm not thirsty. Well, I wasn't talking to you. I didn't come to call the righteous. I'm all right. Well, I wasn't talking to you. I came to call sinners to repentance. In the very midst of the temple where the hostility against Christ was the hottest, and where in just a few more days, seven, I think it's six or seven more days, it will lead to his crucifixion. He turns in that hot bed of hostility and cups his mouth, hands to his mouth, and says, If any man thirst, 
out of that crowd. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. They said, well, we're not thirsty. Well, I wasn't talking to you. I said, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, the last invitation of the Bible is to thirst the people. Thirst the people. You see, we don't believe it, but God's Spirit don't go around offering water to people unless they're thirsty. God's Spirit knows that you can lead a mule to water, but unless he's thirsty, you can't make him drink to save your life. How's that last invitation? Read the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And whoso is a thirst, let him come. And whosoever will, well, if a fellow is thirsty, he will, won't he? If a fellow is not thirsty, he won't, will he? No, sir. Down in Mississippi, I was on the radio, and I wasn't mean they could get a crowd, and I thought I'd do a little something. I was desperate, and on the radio, I said I got five hundred dollar uh, bar and pay to the person who phones in or comes to me and tells me where in the Bible it says whosoever will may come to Christ. Well, I got lots of phone calls. Folks gonna get that five hundred dollars, every one of them. Well, from the twenty-second chapter of the last book of the Bible, begin verse seventy. And we had pretty good Bibles that I had the privilege of having them. When they'd come to me to get $500, I said, well, let's read that. And I'd have them read it. And if you read it, it don't say that. Does it? Oh, no, it don't say it. No. Of course it's true. Whosoever will may come. God won't say, no. I don't. But that's, that don't mean a thing because nobody will. Nobody will. Nobody will. Except thirsty people. Thirsty people. Amen. And whosoever will, let him that is a thirst come. Are you thirsty? Would you like a drink of the water of life that if you drink of it should never thirst? Okay, come on. Are you tired of sinning and scared of dying? Come on. Are you hungry? You're tired of eating, scrapping the, ha- the hogs for the husk. Would you like to eat the bread of life? Come on! Come on. Come on. Somebody says, I'm not hungry. Well, I didn't say anything to you. I don't know anything the Lord's got by way of blessing. I don't know any gift the Lord has for somebody who wouldn't be glad to receive it? Years ago, I went down Wednesday night through Sunday night at the request of a friend who had a good deal of money. He said, if you fly down to Mississippi and give a little church out there those days as a young preacher, he's a student in the Baptist College in Mississippi and he's hungry and and he needs help and said, I'll pay the bill and, and help you if you'll come. And so we set it up and I went down. Young preacher met me. He got off from school Wednesday and, I mean Thursday and Friday. He'd come out and practice on them every weekend. And Wednesday night I preached and Thursday, young preacher was a go-getter. He couldn't be on the field much and so he came and got me early and I wasn't sick then like I've been every time. You've seen me except now. I'm feeling good, praise the Lord. But uh, we went out and we knocking on doorbells. And preached Thursday night and Friday we spent all day knocking on doorbells, talking to people. And Saturday we spent all day visiting around the community, talking to people. Saturday night after the service was over, I'd already gone to bed. And the knock came on the door where I was being in the room where I was being entertained. And come in, and the young pastor came in. He was torn all to pieces. And he sat down and he said, Brother Bond, I don't know what to say. He said, you're older than I am. You're here as my guest. But 
I'm just a young fellow, but said, I'm going to ask you not to preach tomorrow, but I don't want you to preach for us anymore. He said, I just can't, can't stand the way you're doing. And I said, well, what on earth am I doing, young man, that's hurting you so? Well, he said, Brother Barnard, he said, all of our visiting, you just talked about the gospel to one person. Well, I said, I haven't found but one sinner. And I hadn't. You see, I'm forbidden to sow among thorns. I take that pretty seriously. I'm forbidden to give holy things to dogs. The Lord said for me not to. I'm forbidden to cast pearls before swine. All they'll do is trample it. It's not that I'm so mean. It is that I do not want to ignore the plain teaching of the Word of God. I remember we went, boy, we went, went, we went and lost a home. Everybody was all right. Some of them was going to try to come to the meeting one night before it closed, if it didn't rain. You know what I'm doing about. And uh, some of them, they was aiming to come last night, but just they got ready, some folks came in or something, you know. I just heard all the excuses. Everybody was just fine and dandy. And all I do in that home, this is sort of sneaky, but I'd ask if it's all right for us to have a prayer, and they'd say it would, and I'd pray to them. That's all right. And I'd preach them a sermon on the holy demands of a thrice holy God. I wouldn't invite any of them to come to the meeting or anything else. I'd just leave. But we came to one place and that in a nice little way, you know, you person workers, you've been told how to be tactful and, and you know, <laughs> talk about crop for 30 minutes and then the old milk cow for 10 and the riding horse for 15. And that's why I maybe get a chance to put in a word for the Lord. We, we went through all emotions and, and, uh, <clears throat> and directly the fact that we got to go said, be all right, we had a word of prayer. Oh, no. And so he led in prayer and then I, I peeped one eye and let a little bit. And while I was praying, I noticed a woman just a boy. And I quit praying. I thought, the Lord, forgive me. I said, what's the matter to you? And she said, I sure wish I could be saved. But said, I can't. I said, why couldn't you be saved? She said, I'm such a big sinner. Said, I sinned so long. There's no hope for me. Boy. Now, that's the kind of folks I like to be around. And I just wound up and I told her about the pearl of great price, the Son of the living God who came to justify the ungodly. I was forbidden to tell those bunch of self-satisfied infidel church people I'm not going to sow among thorns. I'd be sinning against them. I preached to them the holy claims of God's law. And I explained that to the young preacher, and he said, Well, I understand. I said, Young man, if you'll let me tell you something. Instead of going into the home, trying to get him to take Jesus, go in the homes and do what the Scriptures say. Break up some fallow ground. Get your big old middle bust and go to plow. What do you use? Get the holy demands of a holy God. No man will ever receive Christ as Lord and Savior until he's stripped and slain and conquered by the claims of God's holy law. And we are butchers of souls if we ignore that fundamental truth that God gives his best, and that's Christ, to prepared hearts. You know what that boy did? He took me literally and is visiting from then on out was scriptural. Where he found nice little secure people, he just shot them with God's holy law. If God's holy law won't rout you out of feeling how good you are, you just have to go on to hell. That's his only weapon. And in six weeks after the meeting, he'd had 37 grown people in that little old country community come to him asking if there's any hope 
that they might be saved. I'm telling you, God gives his best, and that's Christ. For Christ is everything. People whose hearts have been prepared. So that it's so wonderful. The Lord tells us, and I must close now, I've talked too long, I understand that, but He says, now before you go out, talk to people. Spend about a half a minute and say, Lord, you go ahead of me. Didn't they used to? Ain't there something like that in the Bible? You go ahead of me. And he said, don't get you a little track that's got the same pill for everybody. Take no thought of what you shall say. You'll never find two individuals in the same shape. Depend on the Holy Ghost. Because he won't use you if you're not full of the Word. But depend on the Holy Ghost to lead you to that portion of truth that will be neat and due season to that place. If he needs his heart plowed by the Holy Spirit's claims and blood.